Well, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for uh, inviting me to uh, to give this talk. Uh, ideally, I would like to uh, be there in person for the workshop, but uh, uh, circumstances prevent prevented travel uh, at this point. But uh, hopefully, uh, I'll see most of you all at the conference uh, in the near future. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, getting onto my science talk, I wanted to talk. To to tell you all about uh, multiplicity in the protostar phase as we observe it. So uh, I've been conducting surveys of nearby star forming regions using the VLA and ALMA to try to characterize multiplicity in its infancy. Uh, and so just to uh, orient everyone, this is uh, a diagram of a what we think a class zero protostar system might look like has an infalling envelope. Uh, so this is the cloud of gas that's collapsing under its own gravity. It conserves angular momentum and forms a disk, and then this can star drive an outflow. Uh, so a system like this may, be, may not be uh, all that similar, at least conceptually, uh, from something like a like an like an AGN. I mean, you have a you have accretion, you have disks, you have outflows. It's just the uh, the energy scales are much different. Um, but then uh, when you zoom in on these disks, uh, they may or may not be the locations of close binary formation. And so we need to be able to, to understand how multiplicity starts. We need to look at the earliest phases with a large range of spatial scales from roughly a tenth of a parsec down to uh, ideally less than uh, 10 AU, but I mean, realistically down to tens of AU is feasible at the, at the present moment. Uh, and, uh, and so the connecting back to multiplicity in the main sequence, this is, a, uh, this is the period and separation distribution, separations at the top, which I made in bigger, a bigger scale of field solar type star multiplicity. And just to highlight how little we knew about the range of protostellar multiplicity in the recent past, about 10 years ago, this unshaded region was really the only region we had good statistics for multiplicity in protostars. And, and unsurprisingly, we found a lot of protostars for multiples in this range. But we're, this was only sampling a very small section of the overall parameter space. We weren't even probing the peak of multiplicity for field solar type stars, which is around 50 AU. But uh, with the surveys that I'm going to present, we're able to expand this uh, region by about, uh, by about a factor of 10. Uh, and so that now we're just sort of getting past the peak of the Gaussian in the field solar type stars probing down to tens of AU scales for the youngest protostars. Uh, so I apologize that there's the black bar, but I don't have a second monitor hooked up to get rid of it, but it won't severely obstruct anything. Um, and so the two surveys uh, uh, that uh, we've conducted are collectively called the Van Dam surveys, so the VLA and Alma nascent disk and multiplicity surveys. We've done two of these, one towards the Perseus star forming region, which is at a distance of about 300 parsecs, and then a second survey toward Orion, which is at a distance of about 400 parsecs. And the, the key things to note are that we're getting resolutions that are of about 20, 20 AU, but more generally more like 30 AU is more typical. But for each of these regions, we're sampling 100 protostars for Perseus and and over 300 for Orion. So we're pushing the statistics into a multiplicity into the ranges that they have been for solar type stars. But now we're doing this for proto stars, which is uh, a big step forward because previous samples were of order a few tens maybe, which uh, leaves a lot to be uh, desired in terms of your statistical robustness. And so overall, what we wanted, what we wanted to find out is how are these multiples forming? And we hope that the statistics will help us better understand that. So are they forming mostly from disk fragmentation directly in the disk 
and as such, we would see them in the di on the scales of the disk, so tens to hundreds of AU. Or are they forming from turbulent fragmentation of the molecular cloud or rotational fragmentation? In which case, we would see them on about hundreds, thousands of AU scales and maybe fewer at, uh, at small radii, except for those that were able to migrate in. So we're trying to understand these, uh, uh, the, the formation mechanisms of these multiples, but by taking a statistical approach. Uh, and so I'll show you a bit uh, of what the data look like before I dive into the statistics. So uh, this is a portion of the Perseus molecular cloud. And so the NGC 1333 region is this, uh, uh, is one of the bigger clusters in the region located here. And the backdrop is the Herschel, uh, is the Herschel uh, three color image from the spire from the spire photometer showing us all of the large scale dust emission from the cloud. And then this is an image of uh, the cluster with Spitzer where we, where we can start to see a lot of the individual protostars and the outflows coming from the protostars. But then we zoom in on these protostars with the VLA. And uh, with the VLA, uh, as I had uh, hinted at, we're getting uh, very good angular resolution compared to what has previously been possible. So our the scale bar here is half of half an arc second, and our beam is typically about uh, 0 0.1 arc second. And uh, uh, we're able to detect many multiple systems. There are also we also detect many single systems as well, though I don't show these for the sake of crowding. And I mean, even in some cases where it looks like we have a binary, we look a little bit deeper on the inside and we indeed see that this bright feature at a bit lower resolution breaks into two point sources at yet higher resolution. And then if we go to Orion, we see that uh, uh, well, Orion sometimes, uh, you may just think of the Orion Nebula, but Orion itself is uh, made up of multiple molecular clouds spanning many tens of parsecs. And when I say Orion, I'm talking about the entire region and its molecular cloud. So our targets sort of span all the way down from the bottom of Orion, which is the L1641 cloud, up to the top of the L1617 cloud. So we're not just probing the, the area around nebula, though it is part of our uh, sample and the nebula is right about here where my mouse cursor is if you can see that. Uh, and I'll just show you a few of the systems from Orion. So on the I'm showing a bit this is a bit different than how I showed it for Perseus, but on the left are the Alma data that we have for the systems. Uh, so there are the left columns here. Then on the right I'm showing you the VLA data for the system. So for Orion, we, get, we had both ALMA and VLA data for both of them at about a factor of 10 difference in wavelength. And uh, what you can sort of see immediately or particularly from this system here is that ALMA tends to pick up the extended dust emission better than the VLA, but the VLA pick, can pick up the point sources a bit better than ALMA does. For instance, there's a second point source in this object here that isn't obvious at all with with ALMA, and that's just due to dust opacity. Uh, and then just showing you specifically the intermediate mass protostars. So these are protostars that have currently have luminosities of many tens to hundreds of solar luminosities, uh, where, we, where we think they will ultimately form a star that's between two to eight solar masses. That it, those are these guys here. And these ones are also found to be quite close binary. So I'm showing a zoom in on these panels now. Uh, I apologize if it's still even a little hard to see, but these are among some of the closest multiples we found, separation of about 40 AU here. And these two systems, this one, this one's not a binary, but the disk uh, is a bit uh, strange looking where we have this linear feature and surrounded by what could be a disk with spiral arms. Uh, but this protostar also sort of exemplifies the fact that we don't always see everything with ALMA. 
because with Alma, we just see, start to see this nice disk, but with the VLA, it breaks up into two point sources and you see the jet from one of the protostars. So with these multiple systems, we've, uh, I, we have a lot of beautiful data to look at, but what we also have are statistics because I'm not showing you even half of the multiples that we have in our sample. So moving on to what, what we get when we put this all together and put all of these multiples into a single, uh, into a, a single characterization uh, of their statistics. Uh, on the left here is the multiplicity fraction of the protostars, and I've broken this up by class, so class zero, which are the youngest, class one, which are a bit more evolved, class one plus flat spectrum, which is a combination of the more evolved protostars, and then just flat spectrum, which seem to be the most evolved protostars. And the horizontal line drawn here is the uh, multiplicity fraction for the field solar type stars, but within this specific range of separations, the 20 to 10,000 AU. Uh, and so it's different from the overall multiplicity fraction because I'm limiting it to what we're sensitive to with our observations. So for the class zeros, you see that they are really the only ones that are significantly different from the multiplicity and companion fractions of the field solar type stars. And, uh, and so that's immediately telling us that most of the multiplicity that we see is occurring in the early stages of star formation and that multi the apparent multiplicity or the spatial association of protostars decreases very rapidly with the evolution of the protostar. So even within the class zero phase, going from the youngest to the not quite so young, uh, but still young protostars, the multiplicity and companion fractions drop uh, quite, quite substantially. Uh, but some of what's happening underneath is sort of hidden by boiling the multiplicity down to just two numbers over the full range, companion fraction and multiplicity fraction. So if we break this up into the distribution of separations, uh, uh, we get a, a bit of another flavor of what's happening for multiplicity. So now I'm plotting the fraction of companions uh, versus the log of the semi-major axis of their projected separation. And the dotted line here is the, lo is the log normal fit to the field solar type stars. So what we see from a combined sample, this is all of our, um, this is all of the classes of protostars combined into one sample. We see this double peaked or bimodal separation distribution where we have a peak just below 100 AU, and then a peak out here at thousands of AU, and we have a bit of a trough in the middle. And this double peak is completely inconsistent with either a log flat distribution, which is uh, OPEX law, or, and it's also inconsistent with this field solar type uh, separation distribution. Uh, and I'll also note that you'll see contamination corrected and no correction. We, we attempted to uh, use the background surface density of YSOs to estimate how many uh, unassociated companions we might be detecting and could be inflating our statistics, statistics at large separations. And so here you can see we get a bit of uh, inflation in our statistics at wide separations, and we've corrected for that as best that we know how at the moment. Uh, and I also want to mention what's going on down here at small separations. So I mentioned that we have resolution of about 20 to 30 AU, but that doesn't mean we're complete down at 20 to uh, 30 AU. Um, dust opacity is causing issues for all my observations. So at some point, even at, at millimeter wavelengths, the, the dense dust sort of for, sort of becomes a brick wall to us and we can't see past it. And then we're also signal to noise limited because we're, uh, because uh, as we have to resolve these systems uh, further and further and the closer together these multiple systems get, as was discussed earlier, there's a limitation to how large those disks can be 
in a tight binary system. And so we're losing signal to noise, even if it's uh, resolvable. So I think there are some completeness issues that aren't fully uh, characterized down at about less than 50 AU. Uh, and so now breaking this into class, just to see what, what is causing what in this double peaked plot, you can see that the class zeros exemplify this uh, double peak in the separation distribution where we have the peak at a bit less than 100 AU. So we have one bin has a bunch of uh, sources in it. And then we have a lot out at greater than 1000 AU. But for class one, we only really get the outer peak. We don't see much at, uh, at small separations, though the error bars on the, on the histograms are roughly consistent with each other uh, for between class zero and class one in this particular bin. And then for flat spectrum, uh, we get a bit of the, we get a bit more at small separations, but the peak at wide separations is essentially gone by the time we get the flat spectrum. And the flat spectrum protostars cannot be distinguished from this field solar type distribution anymore. They are, uh, when you do a KS test or Anderson Darling test, they are, uh, we find them to, they cannot be uh, ruled out as having been drawn from the same parent distribution. So uh, what we think is happening here based on the statistics, we think disk fragmentation is happening at a few hundred AU scales. And we think turbulent fragmentation is happening out here on uh, a bit more than 100 AU to thousands of AU scales. And we might be getting some migrators from turbulent fragmentation. Um, and what I should also emphasize is that, I mean, even going from class zero to class one, multiples that we see here in the class zero phase, they can move inward. Uh, even within uh, the few hundred thousand year time scale between class zero, class zero and class one phase. So nothing in this diagram is expected to remain stationary or expecting to get evolution. Uh, so now I, I, I'm asserting that, we, that that is what we think is happening, but uh, what, what's the evidence for that? So there is evidence for disk fragmentation. So there's a, uh, indirect and direct evidence. So this is sort of the indirect evidence where we look at the outflow directions versus the binary position angles. So for the closest companions, less than 500 AU in separation. So in this example, we know the outflow direction from the jet. We also get that from molecular line observations and we can measure the position angle of the companions. And if, and we assume that the outflow is being driven orthogonal to the disk plane. And we assume that if the binary is related to the disk plane, it should also follow the same distribution of what a disk position angle relative to outflow position angle should, uh, should be. And so we, we ran a very simple, simplistic simulation where we randomly sample out, uh, the projections of the system. Uh, random outflow orientations, random inclinations of the system. And then we measured the position angles relative to the outflow angles for all of the protostars with separations less than 500 AU and Perseus and Orion. And this is the curve that we get uh, for the observations. And uh, this line that sort of agrees the best is the model where the outflows are preferentially are going to be orthogonal to the disk plane. And so this cannot be ruled out from a, as having been drawn from the same parent distribution using a, a KS or Anderson Darling test. But as you can see, the more you add in random outflow orientations relative to the disk plane or the binary plane, the worse that they agree with our model. So we think that this is evidence that the companion uh, does know something about the disk plane. And so we're taking this as indirect evidence of disk fragmentation. Uh, but some other evidence uh, can be found just by looking at our data. This is uh, a system that's been, I think has been shown already, L1440 IRS3B. This is the, the, the view you get from the VLA. You see 
three point sources here, maybe something going on in the at low surface brightness in the background. But you image this with Alma, you get a uh, much higher fidelity view of the circum uh, multiple dust emission. And there's even a sharper image of this with uh, more recent Alma observations where we clearly resolve the triple. So there's three point sources here that are well detected at all uh, spatial scales. And the center of mass of the system, so sorry, I'm giving you a abrupt transition to a line center velocity map measured with C170. Uh, the C170 line kinematics point to a center of mass sort of right around these sources right here. So the so we know the center of mass of the system, we know the mass of the system, and we're, we've been able to confirm that at least with our best knowledge of dust to gas ratios, this is indeed a gravitationally unstable disk. Likely and that's the likely explanation for this very bright uh, source in the outer disk that does not dominate the kinematics because it, while it's bright in dust, it is not, does not have a whole lot of mass at present. But it is driving a jet and outflow, and so it uh, has formed a protostar, but it's as of yet low mass. And there's a few other, few other cases where we find very close binaries embedded within much larger structures. This is uh, this is uh, another example where the, the binary has a separation which is roughly within the orbit of Pluto in our own solar system and has very uh, 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 very uh, amorphous distribution of dust. And we've gotten a couple of uh, extra observations of this where we now see motion of the companion given how close it is so we can actually see we can actually start mapping orbits of these uh, protostars now. And higher resolutions observations of the dust uh, give us uh, a more detailed picture of what's going on in this system. And, and uh, these almost three millimeter observations have highlighted that, well, now this is probably even a triple system because this is a robust point source, which uh, was not which was there in our original VLA observations, but it was sort of at the four sigma level, so we didn't know what to make of it. But the subsequent VLA observations have also confirmed that this third source is indeed a true, that is a real source. And uh, and I know I'm running out of time, and I'm almost at my last slide. This is uh, another recent observation towards uh, a different type of protostar. This is an isolated protostar that appears as if magnetic fields could be dominating the collapse of this system, uh, where it has a polyol magnetic field, very little rotation in the envelope, scant evidence of a disk. But with the VLA, we, we resolve what looks like a 16 AU binary, which uh, as of yet is the closest binary that's been resolved uh, towards a uh, towards a class zero protostar. And it's the closest, one of the closest companions that we've ever seen thus far with uh, and then uh, using dust emission from an interferometer. Uh, oh, I thought that was my last slide, but not quite. So now coming back to the evidence for migration, which I'll go over this quickly. Um, something we see is that in between, for a multiplicity fraction between 100 and 1000 AU, we see that class zero protostars are consistent between regions of high and low YSO density. So multiples in this range of separation for the youngest protostars, they tend to form the same. There's no excess of companions depending on your environment. But for class one and flat spectrum protostars, there is an excess here of apparent companions in regions of high YSO density. And it seems to be, and it's right, it's, and also it seems to be rising above what it was for class zero protostars. So uh, even though the, it's sort of within the air bars, this could be evidence that multiplicity is increasing from increasing at later stages of protostars. And we think this could be due to uh, my, migration. And so I'll skip the next slide and put up my summary. And so uh, in summary, multiplicity is prevalent across the 
protostellar phase with, for most classes, the properties are distinct from uh, field stars, especially with this double peak separation distribution. We, we argue that both gravitational instability and turbulent fragmentation are necessary to produce the statistics that we see. And we're finding some evidence for migration in the statistics, and we're also finding direct and indirect evidence for disk fragmentation. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And we'll have some questions. Hi, John, it's uh, Matthew Bate here. <clears throat> um, shame you couldn't make it. I was looking forward to having a big long chat with you. Um, just, this is not really a question. I guess it's more of a comment. And just to say, I know some people love disk fragmentation, but I think that it's overemphasized. Um, and um, I think it's actually, I mean, again, I know observers like, you know, write an observer in proposal saying, you know, we want to distinguish between disk fragmentation and cloud fragmentation or something or other. But I don't think it's that easy because, it, uh, well, this, this conference is all about the effects of accretion, and it doesn't really matter how you form uh, a binary in the first place. The subsequent evolution can completely change its properties. Um, so, I mean, I was just looking at the end of your talk about, you know, my paper on uh, disk properties from 2018. Um, there's a plot in there where I look at the, the um, distributions of angles between, say, spins in systems that have been formed separately and then undergo uh, star disk encounters to form binaries, for example. And you find that they have a preference for alignment, even though they formed completely separately and then formed a binary later on. So I, just just a comment that, you know, the, the observations are wonderful and um, you're doing fantastic work, but I'm not sure you can attribute things to disk versus cloud fragmentation quite so easily. Okay, yeah, that, that, thank you, I agree. So yeah, we're, yeah, as, as, you, as you probably read the papers, we sort of, we we hedge a little bit, and we we try not to be absolutely definitive uh, uh, in this case. But um, yeah, and I mean, it's uh, I think it is important for how they. It's important for us to understand where they, where the binaries, how they start, and how they how they evolve. And so, um, I don't think all hope is lost, but I, I do tend to uh, agree with you that evolution can change things. So, for instance, even in the this beautiful L1448 system, I cannot positively say that this disk fragmentation, even though thus far that a lot of the signs are pointing towards it, and this is because, uh, like things you show in your simulations, that after a merger, things can relax, so can sort of re-equilibrate over over time and appear to look like they uh, have always been that way, even if they started out completely differently. Ian, go ahead. Hi, John. Uh, Ian Chakal here. Thank you for the very nice uh, talk. I was wondering, um, you had mentioned you had uh, some hint of that the binary sort of knew about the disk, and I was wondering if you had um, enough uh, statistical leverage to sort of gain insight into how the disk, circumbinary disk slash binary orientation might change uh, throughout class zero one flat spectrum, or is that something that might still be too small number statistics to, to gain insight into it just yet? I think it might be too small number statistics as of yet, and I think we need to we need to look into it a bit further. So, what what I'm what I've been using as the signpost for the disk is the is for a circumbinary disk or a common angular momentum vector was the was the outflow, assuming that it's going to be launched orthogonal to the 
to the overall disk. Uh, but what 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 has sort of conspired against us a little bit, I think, is that it it has turned out to be more difficult to characterize some of the circumbinary material than than we had initially thought. So uh, I don't have a great I don't have a great example to show you, but a lot, sometimes what can happen is we see two point sources with Alma, but we don't see a whole lot surrounding it, and so you can you can argue that. You could argue that well, some either disk fragmented made a second protostar and accreted a lot of that material, so it's still there but below our detection level. And so I, I think for for Perseus, I think we're we, we're in a bit better state for the circumbinary material because there's fewer sources and it's a bit closer. But for Orion, it's proven a bit more difficult to characterize the circumbinary material itself. Uh, because of the because of the greater distance and the fact that it seems like it might be lower surface brightness and it's been particularly more difficult for like the class ones uh, the circumbinary materials even uh, seems to be even more tenuous than it was for class zeros so it's just figuring out what that circumbinary binary material is doing is uh, a challenge right now. Thank you. I have a quick question. Uh, you mentioned that you're beginning to determine an orbit for one of these systems. Is that, are, are you likely to be able to determine uh, eccentricities or uh, uh, semi-major axes for these systems? Is that possible? Yeah, I think that that is the hope, though it, it, it may take a while yet. So uh, as you, so uh, as you can see, that's this image here. So uh, the contours are the 2012 data and the 2019 data are the color. So you can see there's a shift of about like maybe half the beam or a, or a third of the beam, which I mean, that's still, uh, it's still a, uh, a significant change in the position of the source and we can we can map its motion, but it just it's probably gonna take another decade of monitoring these things before we can trace out even a small portion of the orbit. So and I even with just having a few epochs, I've played around with orbitize a little bit to try to see what we could say. And we can't say too much about the eccentricity at this point, but maybe with another five, ten years of uh monitoring so if we get like maybe one or two more points as it's um, as it continues on its orbit we can hopefully say more about this system and then other systems as well okay uh, maybe we should stop the questions here and thanks John again.